Okay, uh, welcome to the Oxford Discrete Mass and uh, Probability Seminar. Um, uh, so, as usual, please do, if you want to ask questions, signal in the chat, um, or we'll open it up at the end. Um, so this week, it's a great pleasure to have uh, Issa Saumann, who's going to talk on the extension complexity of low-dimensional polytopes. Thank you very much for the introduction, and thank you for the invitation to give this talk. And all I'm talking about today is joint work with Matthew Kwan and Yu Fei Zhao. Okay, so um, as some motivation, let's start with something very simple. So here you see a regular hexagon and it has six faces, so six edges. So that means if we want to describe this regular hexagon by linear inequalities, we have to write down at least six such linear inequalities. So we want to describe it by linear constraints or in other words as an intersection of half planes, we'll need at least six such constraints just because we have six edges. Okay, but here's a curious observation. Um, even though this um, hexagon itself has six edges, there exists a three-dimensional polytope with only five facets whose projection is this regular hexagon. So here you can see this three-dimensional solid body. And this one you can describe with only five constraints, so only five linear inequalities because it has only five facets. And still you can project down to this regular hexagon where itself you would need six inequalities to describe it. And let me also mention that this construction here um, is somewhat special to the regular hexagon. It also works for certain other, hex um, other hexagons, but for most hexagons, you can't do this. So for most hexagons, you can't find this five, uh, this three-dimensional polytope with only five faces projecting to it. Only works for a special class of hexagons. Okay. So here's again our observation. The regular hexagon itself has six faces. But we can get it as the projection of a three-dimensional polytope that has only five facets. So now you might wonder, why, why would anybody care? Um, but so um, let's first, before we answer the question, why would we care, um, make a more general definition along these lines. So um, in general, kind of this sort of curious observation leads us to the following definition of a concept called extension complexity. So we define the extension complexity of a d-dimensional polytope P, so here P would be this hexagon, to be the minimum number of facets in a possibly higher dimensional polytope so that one can obtain P, uh, in a possibly higher dimensional polytope P prime, so that one can obtain P as the image of P prime under a linear projection. So in this example, we can take P prime to be this three-dimensional solid, and so that way we see that the extension complexity of this regular hexagon is certainly at most five because we can find such a P prime with only five faces. And in fact, um, one can also show that the extension complexity of the regular hexagon is actually equal to five. So we can no, do no better than this um, five faced thing here. Um, and just to kind of, so, so, so that means the extension complexity of a regular hexagon is equal to five. Um, and um, more, more generally, Bental and Nemirovsky proved that the extension complexity of a regular n-gon, so a set of a hexagon and n-gon, has extension complexity on the order of log n. Okay, but so I want to point out here again that this fact that the regular hexagon has extension complexity only five and not six is somewhat special to the regular hexagon and to other, other hexagons. So this sort of construction only works for certain special hexagons. Okay, so, um, so this is the definition of extension complexity again. We have, we're given a d-dimensional polytope P and we define its extension complexity to be the minimum number of facets in a polytope P prime, which may have higher dimension. So that one can get P from P prime as, as some image of a linear projection. Okay, so now uh, why would anybody care about this weird definition? Well, actually, so this looks probably extremely weird if you see this the first time. Um, but in fact, this notion has been studied for several decades um, and has a, so it has a long history and it's mostly motivated by its relevance for combinatorial optimization problems. 
So let me not get into detail too much here, but basically the idea is if you have some combinatorial optimization problem that you want to solve over the polytope P, then how efficient your algorithms for solving this are will depend on how many faces you have, because how many that will depend on how many inequalities you kind of need to deal with at each step. So if P has a lot of facets, that makes your algorithm very slow. However, there are cases where you can find such a P prime with much, much fewer facets. It might have higher dimension, but it has, may have much, much fewer facets, which projects to P. And then you can basically lift your optimization problem from P all the way up to P prime, and then solve your optimization problem in P prime instead, which may be much more efficient if P prime has way fewer facets. And so that will then also give you the solution back in P. And so for that reason, kind of this sort of notion is important in combinatorial optimization. Okay, so in particular, for, for that reason, um, it has, there has been a lot of work on, on this concept of extension complexity for specific polytopes which are relevant in certain optimization problems like, for example, the correlation polytope, the traveling salesman polytope, or the perfect matching polytope. So these correspond to certain important optimization problems that people like to solve. And so um, and naturally, they study, there, there's been a lot of work studying the extension complexity of these particular polytopes. So I don't want to go into detail there, um, but let me just mention as a general remark that it's um, even for a concretely given polytope, a difficult problem to actually determine the extension complexity. So these polytopes are obviously very complicated, but even if you have a fairly simple polytope, it's actually difficult to determine the extension complexity. Okay, so um, before going on, let me tell you some simple general facts about extension complexity. So um, so most of these facts, for, or some of them follow directly from the definition, some of them follow with a bit more work, but they're all not super hard. So again, just as a reminder, if we have a polytope P, the extension complexity is the minimum number of facets in some polytope P prime that projects to P. Okay, so the first trivial observation is that this extension complexity is always at most the number of facets of P. So that's just because we could take P prime equal to P. One can also show that's maybe less obvious that it's at most the number of vertices of P. Okay, so that gives us some upper bounds on the extension complexity. Um, and so concerning general lower bounds in the same spirit, one can show that the, uh, if we have a polytope with N vertices, then the extension complexity is at least the binary logarithm of N. And similarly, if we have a polytope with M facets, then the extension complexity is also at most the binary logarithm of M. And so for these three statements, you see that they are all kind of, I mean, they are symmetric basically with respect to the roles that the number of vertices and the number of facets play. And that's actually not a coincidence because one can in general show that the extension complexity of a polytope P equals the extension complexity of its polar dual polytope P star. So this polar dual polytope interchanges the roles that the vertices and facets play. And so in particular, it interchanges the number of vertices with the number of facets. And so this fact that the extension complexity of P equals the extension complexity of P star in particular means that all sorts of general inequalities like those ones we get um, need to be kind of, M and N need to be symmetric, um, kind of need to play symmetric roles in these inequalities. Okay, and then one last fact, if we if the polytope P is d-dimensional, and so with that, I don't mean that it's embedded in RD, but that it's truly d-dimensional. So it can be embedded in RD, but then doesn't lie in a lower dimensional hyperplane then. So if the polytope P is truly d-dimensional, then um, the extension complexity is at least d plus one. Okay, and so from all these facts, um, it's not so hard to see that the extension complexity of an n minus one dimensional n vertex simplex is equal to n. So it has to be at least n because of the last property, because it's at least the dimension plus one, and it's at most n because of the first property, either applied to vertices or to facets, um, because the n vertex simplex has n vertices and n facets. 
Okay. So, um, are there any questions so far? I can't actually see the chat, so maybe someone could alert me in case a question comes up in the chat. That's absolutely fine. I'll let you know. Okay. Okay, great. So then, um, then, um, so here's again the definition. Um, and so then let, we can, let's ask the following very natural extremal question about extension complexity. So kind of, I guess I work mostly in extremal combinatorics. And so we ask kind of extremal combinatorics, people ask what's kind of the maximum that some sort of combinatorial quantity, maximum or minimum that some sort of combinatorial quantity can take under some constraints. And so here's a very natural extremal question about this notion of extension complexity. Namely, what's the maximum possible extension complexity of a polytope with say n vertices or with n facets? I mean, as we just saw, it doesn't make a difference whether we ask for n vertices or with n facets because the answer should be the same. Okay, so this is actually a very easy question. So I basically already told you the answer on the last slide. The answer is this maximum is just equal to n because so that's attained by taking this n minus this one dimensional n vertex simplex that we just saw at the bottom of the last slide that the extension complexity is equal to n. And we also saw on the last slide that every n, say n vertex polytope has extension complexity at most n. Okay, so the, and every n vertex polytope has extension complexity at most n and that's attained by this simplex, the n minus one dimensional n vertex simplex. So this question is actually really easy and the answer is n. So that wasn't very interesting. But here is a slight, a slight modification of the question, which is actually much more interesting and still open um, and has been studied for quite a while. Namely, what happens if we restrict the dimension of the polytope? So note that this n minus one dimension n vertex simplex, I mean, the dimension is really, really high being n minus one. What happens if we just fix the dimension to be something? So we ask the same question, but for a fixed dimension. So the question then becomes for some fixed dimension D and some number N, which we imagine to be large with respect to D, what is the maximum possible extension complexity of a D dimensional polytope with N vertices? So again, we ask, we say we want N vertices, but now we also prescribe the dimension to be some fixed number D. And again, ask the same question for the maximum possible extension complexity. Okay, and so it's been, um, so now the question is much, I mean, has been studied and considered for quite a while. Um, and it's much less obvious than the question on the last slide. Um, but actually it has been widely believed that this, um, this fixing the dimension D shouldn't change the answer. So it's been widely believed that for any fixed dimension D, the extension complexity of an N vertex polytope can still be as large as N. So we know it as, it's as most N because it has N vertices. Now the example of the simplex doesn't work anymore, but people believe that one can find better examples which are only d-dimensional and the answer doesn't change, it's still n. But in fact, this is false. So this was disproved independently by Sheetoff and by Padrol and Pfeiffle for d equals two. So they proved that any two-dimensional n vertex polytope, so that would be a two-dimensional n gone has extension complexity at least, uh, at most six n over seven. So you can't go all the way up to n anymore. It has extension complexity at most six n over seven. And um, later the same year, so that was a few years ago, later the same year, Sheetoff improved uh, the bound to extension complexity at most little o of n. And then um, about a year ago, he improved it again to extension complexity at most on the order of n to the two thirds. And that's the best known bound. But these are all for the two dimensional case. Okay, so um, for larger than two dimensions, so for D bigger than two, no non-trivial upper bounds are known for this question. So then the best known upper bound is still this trivial bound of n. And uh, a priori it's possible that if you kind of take this fixed dimension to be three that you can get all the way up to n, even though that seems unlikely in, in light of the results for two dimensions. Okay, but so this is a very hard problem which is, has been studied by many people. Um, but yeah, so, um, so I told you about the upper bound so far. So a natural question 
to ask is what about lower bounds? And so here's what's known concerning lower bounds. So first Fiorini, Rothrost, and Tivari proved that almost all n-gons, so again for two dimensions, um, all two dimensional and vertex polygons, polytopes have extension complexity at least on the order of square root n. And then a little bit later, Padrol extended this result to um, d-dimensional polytopes. So he proved that almost all d-dimensional polytopes with n vertices have extension complexity at least on the order of square root dn. And so both of these works use slightly different notions of almost all, and I don't want to go into the details what the exact almost all version, uh, notions are, but kind of the punchline basically of both of these results is that kind of if you pick a polytope generically, um, it, you get um, those lower bounds for the extension complexity. And in some sense, it's not at all surprising that to picking something generically or say randomly um, should lead to high extension complexity. So that should be a good candidate for kind of proving lower bounds for this question. Because um, if we con um, think back of our example of the regular hexagon in the beginning, we discussed that this doing this particular construction with this five-faced three-dimensional solid was special to the regular hexagon and certain other hexagons. But if you kind of take a random or generic hexagon, you can't do this and the extension complexity would be six. Whereas having this kind of basically nice way to do it with only five things relies on special properties of the regular hexagon. So it's kind of intuitively fairly plausible that if you pick a random polytope, you should exhibit very high, maybe the highest possible extension complexity. And so it's a very natural approach to prove lower bounds to this question by studying random polytopes. Um, so yeah, so that's what you just said. It seems plausible that random polytopes typically have the maximum possible or at least fairly high extension complexity. Um, so that then leads to the question, what actually is the extension complexity of a random polytope? So maybe somewhat more precisely, for, we want to fix the dimension d, and then we ask what's typically the extension complexity for a random d-dimension polytope with n vertices. And so these results on the last slide gave lower bounds for this, but they kind of only gave lower bounds uh, for the extension complexity of these random polytopes. They didn't study what the actual answer is. So a priori, it might be just much higher than the bounds they proved. Um, and so um, I think, so in, in addition to this question about the extension complexity of random polytopes being a natural approach for lower bounds for the extremal question up here, a second motivation for asking this question of the extension complexity of random polytopes is also that it's in some sense a fairly natural question to ask, right? Because there's a large amount of literature on random polytopes, so that's an important subject in probability theory. And then there's a large amount of literature on extension complexity. So um, it's actually, I think, reasonably natural to ask, well, what's this sort of parameter of extension complexity for a random polytope? Okay, so this is this, this is basically the question um, that well, a large part of this talk is focusing about. Um, but so in order to, well, the question obviously still doesn't make much sense because I didn't tell you what I mean by random D-dimension polytopes. So make, to make this question sensible, I need to tell you what sort of models of random D-dimension polytopes you want to consider in this talk. Okay, so again, D is fixed. And here are the two different models for random d-dimension polytopes that we consider in this work. Obviously, there are many more other models. These are just the ones we considered here. So, um, so the first model um, is the following. Namely, we take n uh, independent uniformly random points on the unit sphere in Rd, and then we let the polytope P be their convex hull. So we take the sphere, we take all these points on the sphere, these n points, uh, uniformly at random, and then we take the convex hull, then we always get a polytope with n vertices. Um, with pro I mean, with probability one. Uh, I mean, not always, but uh, with probability one. Okay, so, um, but here, so, so this is the first model. And um, um, now let me mention the second model. So that's a 
uh, kind of, it looks very similar, but it's actually a little bit different. So here we choose M independent uniformly random points, but instead of choosing them on the unit sphere, we now choose them in the unit ball. So we can, we don't restrain ourselves to the boundary of the ball, but we kind of can pick them from the entire ball. And then we again let the polytope be the convex hull. So now in contrast to the first model here in this model, it won't be the case that each of our random points is a vertex of the polytope, right? Because it can happen that some point lies in the convex tile of the other points that we choose. Um, but so this model is actually a well-studied random polytope model and already um, 15 years ago, Reitzner showed um, that asymptotically almost surely the number of vertices of this polytope is on the order of m to the d minus one over d plus one. So that means if we now pick our parameter m for the number of random points, suitably we can make sure that um, asymptotically almost truly we have on the order of n vertices, which is the number we wanted. Okay. Um, yeah, are there any questions in the chat, chat or otherwise? Okay, great. So then um, let me, um, let me tell you what our results actually are about those two models. So we want to study the extension complexity of random polytopes chosen according to those two models. So in this always we fix our dimension D to be some number at least two. Okay, so now for the first model, what we showed, and that is um, as everything in this talk joint work with Matthew Fan and Yuki Zhao. So if we let P to be the convex hull of these N random points on the unit sphere, so that is our first model, there in Rd, then asymptotically almost surely the extension complexity of P is on the order of square root N. Okay, so again, I mean, in this case, we have N vertices. And so we show the extension complexity is uh, on the order of the square root of the number of vertices, which is N in this case. And then for the second model, if P is the convex hull of M random points in the unit ball in Rd, then let's for convenience define n to be m to the d minus one over d plus one. So the relevance of this quantity n is that by the Schwarzner result, the number of vertices of p is on the order of n. And then again, we show that asymptotically almost truly the extension complexity of p is on the order of square root n. So that means again on the order of the square root of the number of vertices. Okay, so in short, for both models, we show that the extension complexity is asymptotically almost surely on the order of the square root of the number of vertices. And so um, the lower bounds here are basic, were basically already known. So in the second theorem, the lower bound is literally implied by this result of Padol that I mentioned earlier. Um, and for both, um, both theorems, the lower bound can, on the extension complexity can easily be proved using the arguments of Fiorini, Rothbard, and Tivari in this result. I, mentioned earlier, even though the result doesn't literally carry over, the proof basically does. But so the interesting part of this work is to show the upper bound. So in some sense, the upper bound doesn't tell you anything about the motivating extreme question we started in the beginning, but at least it tells you that you can't do better by considering random polytopes. And also, I think it's kind of interesting to just know what the answer is for random polytopes. Okay. So here's again, uh, kind of a short summary of, of these results. So we proved that for every fixed dimension D at least two, for both of the two models of random polytopes that we considered, we proved that the extension complexity is asymptotically almost truly on the order of the square root of the number of vertices. So um, as I said, this doesn't actually tell us anything new about this open question, um, the open question, I mean, this open extreme question about the, um, uh, uh, I mean, if you fix the dimension D and have large N, this extreme question was asking what's the maximum possible extension complexity of a D dimension polytope with N vertices. So as I said, our result, these results don't actually tell us anything new about it, at least not strictly. I mean, they don't prove anything new about it, but one could see this as an indication that it's likely that the extension complexity is maybe always at most only of order square root n. Because as we discussed heuristically, it's very plausible that random polytopes would exhibit the maximum possible. And so it's now tempting to conjecture that the answer to this 
extreme question is that the extension complexity is always at most lower square root n. And as I said earlier, that's um, a very hard question. And the best known bound for d equals two is um, the order of n to the two thirds. And for d larger than two, no non-trivial upper bounds are known. So kind of, um, but it's, it's um, yeah. So one could see these random polytope results that we have as a piece of heuristical evidence that we might conjecture that such an O of square root n bound. But yeah, so this question is very hard. So what happens if we make our life a little bit easier as, okay, sorry. Yeah, so this is what I just already said. This is, so it's plausible that random polytopes would exhibit the maximum possible extension complexity, but it's not at all clear. I mean, that's not cool. But yeah, so this question is very hard. What happens if we try to make our life a little bit easier? So here the question was, does every D dimension polytope with N vertices have com extension complexity at least uh, at most O of square root N? So that's a very hard question. So what happens if we make our life easier and restrict ourselves to special classes of polytopes? So for example, what happens for polytopes of all vertices on a sphere? So that sounds particularly nice. And also it has somewhat similar to the random polytope models we consider. So then we still, then the answer uh, question is unfortunately still difficult and still open. Um, but so that would lead to the following still open question. So does every D dimension N vertex polytope with all vertices on a common sphere have extension complexity at most over square root n. And so, yeah, as I said, this is still open, but at least we proved that the answer is yes for D equals two. So in a kind of separate result that's proved by somewhat similar methods as our random polytope results, we proved that if P is a two dimensional N vertex polygon, polytope, so that means an N gon with all vertices on a common circle, then P has extension complexity at most 24 square root N. Um, and just to make a nice illustration of this, so you just, so basically the result says, if you take a circle and then you take your N vertices on, on the circle, then the resulting um, polygon always has extension complexity at most 24 square root N. And this bound is tied up to the constant factor 24. So that follows, for example, from these um, results that if we choose the, um, points randomly on the circle, then we get this lower bound of square root n. And yeah, as I said, for this um, theorem up here, the proof follows a somewhat similar strategy as the results for random polytopes, but obviously some parts of the proof are different. Okay. Um, uh, are there any questions in the chat or? Okay, so then um, I'd like to use the rest of the time of the talk. Ah, no, sorry. I um, wanted to first make some other remarks. So um, I want to use the, most of the rest of the time of the uh, uh, talk to tell you something about the proof, but let me first finish by making some other remarks um, concerning the results. So it's a very natural question to ask, um, what happens if we don't fix the dimension D? So how much, I mean, how much can we still expect to hold if we allow the dimension D to grow slowly with N. And um, actually then one has to be very careful because we also proved that well, depending on how fast we let D grow with N, um, you might actually get all the way or at least very close to extension complexity N. So more precisely, we proved that there are polytopes of the dimension N to the little O of one. So very, very, um, so in some sense, very slowly growing with N so that the extension complexity is still close to N. So here's a more precise version of this theorem. So for any N, there exists a polytope with at most N vertices, with dimension at most N to the little o of one, but extension complexity at least N to the one minus little o of one. Okay, so in other words, this says that, um, I mean, if you let the dimension grow even slower than the term we have here, which is not explicitly spelled out, you might still expect something interesting to happen, but you need to be careful. I mean, even with fairly slow growth, like n to the little o of one, you can still get extremely high up with extension complexity. Okay, um, but so I think there are many more interesting open questions along these lines. So for example, one could ask about the, um, um, 
one can ask about well, what's, for example, the minimum dimension we need to take so that we can exactly get all the way up to n. So in this result up here, we only get close to extension complexity n. But I think a very natural question to ask is if we uh, have some given n, what's the minimum dimension d we can take so that th it is possible to reach extension complexity equal to n, so that it is possible to find the d dimension polytope with n vertices and extension complexity truly equal to n, not just close to n. So that's a very natural question. I think it's also natural to ask about the extension complexity of random polytopes where we let the dimension grow slowly with n, but we didn't study that at all. So our work is all in the realm where d is truly fixed. Okay, so, so that's what I wanted to, these were some more remarks about the, um, about the results, but so for the rest of the time, I wanna talk about the proofs. And so in particular, um, we, I, I'd like to focus on, I mean, we obviously can't discuss the whole proofs, but I'd like to give you a glimpse of how the proofs works for these um, random polytope results. Um, and as I said, the result with the polygons uh, with all vertices on a circle is roughly a similar strategy. Um, but so in order to kind of talk about this, we first need to take a detour. So I first need to tell you about this notion of non-negative rank, which is actually closely connected to extension complexity. And um, so we use that connection in the proof. So let me introduce this concept of non-negative rank. And so here, in the first box, you see the definition of the rank of a matrix, which all of you know, but I mean, there are obviously many different ways to define the rank of a matrix. And there's one way to, which is convenient to write down here to draw an analog to this non-negative rank notion. And that's the following. So the rank of an M by N matrix with real entries say, so a matrix in R to the M by N is the minimum number R so that we can factor this matrix M as T times U where T is an M by R matrix and U is an R by N matrix. So that's maybe not the most natural way to define the rank of a matrix, but it is a valid definition. And so now let's modify this to define the non-negative rank. And basically the idea is, so uh, for this definition is um, that uh, we take this normal definition of ordinary rank and then we make everything non-negative. So we, define the, and so that's a standard definition, the non-negative rank of a non-negative M by N matrix. Um, so that would be a, a, non, a, a matrix uh, with non-negative entries in M by N matrix is the minimum number R so that again, there is a factorization of M as T times U for again, M by R and R by N matrices T and U, but we now impose that these matrices in T and U are also non-negative. So in other words, the difference between the bottom definition and the top definition is that we insist on the matrices T and U to be non-negative. So we only allow certain factorizations and then we again take the minimum R. And so kind of just from, I mean, it just now basically tautologically follows that the non-negative rank of, of a matrix M uh, is always at least its ordinary rank because we kind of restrict the factorizations that we allow, but it may actually be much larger. So there are examples where the non-negative rank is much, much larger than the ordinary rank. Okay, so, so far this seems totally disconnected from um, extension complexity and everything we've been, been discussing before. But so here, let me, tr um, um, let me draw this connection. So given a polytope P and RD, as we said, um, we are interested in describing P in, uh, by a list of linear uh, constraints, so linear inequalities which correspond to the facets of P. So, so that's basically what you do when you do the sort of um, combinatorial optimization motivation for extension complexity. I guess here we always only care about counting the facets, but anyway, so you can describe P by kind of these list of linear inequalities, so in other words, by an intersection of half spaces. And so now what we want to define is for a vertex V of the polytope P, we want to define the slack of the vertex V with respect to one of these inequalities. So each of these inequalities we can write as A dot X is as most B, so that defines a linear inequality. And now we define for a vertex V of the polytope, we define its slack with respect to such a constraint 
to be just the difference of the two sides, namely as b minus a dot v. And so notice that because v is supposed to be a vertex of the polytope p, v does satisfy this inequality. So a dot v is at most b. And so this difference b minus a dot v is non-negative. And um, so, that's, so that means the slack of this vertex is a non-negative number, basically just describing how much slack there is in this constraint for this vertex. Okay, and now the slack matrix of the polytope P is simply defined to be the non-negative matrix of all the slacks as entries. So maybe to make this a little bit more precise, so the slack matrix is a matrix where the rows are indexed by the vertices and the columns are indexed by the facets or constraints. And so then in each entry of the matrix, we write the slack of that vertex with respect to that constraint, okay? And so that's now a non-negative matrix because all these slacks are non-negative numbers. Okay, um, so this is a complicated definition, but here's a somewhat easier way to think about it. So um, if you normalize these constraints in a suitable way, then this sort of slack is exactly the, the distance of the vertex with respect to the hyperplane through the facet. So if you have a facet that gives you some constraint, um, so some such linear inequality, and if you choose the normalization appropriately, you can uh, make it so that the slack of each vertex is just the distance of the vertex with respect to the hyperplane passing through that face. Uh, and so that means that um, we could alternatively, I mean, it's not exactly uh, the nicest way to set up the theory, but you can just think of the slack matrix as the matrix where the rows are indexed by the vertices and the columns are indexed by the, by the facets and every entry describes the distance of the vertex with respect to the hyperplane to the facet. Um, so that's an, I mean, that's a different way to say it, which might be somewhat easier to think about. But in any case, maybe for now, we can just think of the slack matrix as some sort of matrix we somehow get from the polytope, maybe not even for this talk, the most important, how we get exactly. Um, but so here's the following very important theorem of Yanakakis, which now draws this connection I promised you from the non-negative rank to the notion of extension complexity. And so this theorem, by the way, is uh, now almost, 30 years old, so it really is a classical theorem in this area. So Jana Kalkis proved that the non-negative rank of the slack matrix of any polytope is equal to its extension complexity. That looks very surprising if you see it the first time, um, but um, it's true. And so the proof is also not even extremely hard. So the proof basically just unravels all steps in the definitions and kind of do some kind of clever manipulations. It's not very long. It's, it's a nice proof. But anyway, so, so we now know that if we want to study the extension complexity of any polytope, we might as well study the non-negative rank of its slack matrix. And so that's the approach we take to prove these desired upper bounds for the extension complexity of, for example, the random polytopes we study. So what we do is we want to upper bound the non-negative rank of the slack matrices of these polytopes. Okay, so um, let me now um, give you a brief overview of kind of how this, I mean, of the main ideas of this proof. So this is basically now a proof overview for our random polytope results. So here again, the results. So we have these two models of random polytopes. Um, and um, we want to show that um, asymptotically, almost surely the extension complexity is on the order of the square root of the number of vertices. And as I said, the lower bounds are not the interesting part here interesting part at the upper bound. So that's when I, what I want to give a brief sketch of. And so, as I mentioned, the, the idea is to go via this connection to a negative rank. Okay, so, um, so for these two, th so in the first theorem, kind of um, according to our random polytope models there, kind of the vertices of this polytope P will all be on the unit sphere. And in the second theorem, that's not true because we chose the vertices to be random points in the unit ball. So they are not really on the unit sphere, but one can show that it's very, um, that typically when we cho choose the polytope P according to the second model, the vertices will actually be fairly close to the unit sphere. And the reason is if you choose a random, um, if one of 
your random point is very close to the center of the ball, then it's extremely unlikely to end up being a vertex because it's going to be most likely in the convex hull of other random points. Okay. And so that means in both cases, the vertices are typically very close. So in the first case on, in the second case, very close to the unit sphere. And also in bo both cases, just because of the ran uh, randomness, they are fairly well distributed kind of all, all the way around the unit sphere. So they don't cluster together and have a clusters in one place and there are also no large gaps where there are no points at all. Okay, and so, um, the proofs of both of these theorems are then using these geometric properties very similar. The second one requires a bit more work um, and one has to be a bit more careful because the points are not exactly on the unit sphere. But so let me kind of in this overview focus just on the first theorem, but I just wanna mention that the second one follows overall a very similar strategy. It's just a bit more work at some points. So now from now on, let's kind of for simplicity just assume that uh, P is this according to, to, chosen according to this first model where we take n random points on the unit sphere and then we take the convex hull. Okay, so what we do is we fix the dimension D and as I said, P is a D dimension polytope where the vertices are chosen uh, randomly, um, say now on the unit sphere. And um, so to introduce some more notation, we call V the set of vertices of P which is then the set of these random points, and F the set of facets of P. And as I said, we want to study the slack matrix of P because we want to study an upper bound that's not negative rank. So we call the slack matrix M, and it has rows indexed by, this, by V, so by the vertices, and columns indexed by F, so by the facets. Okay, so here is a key lemma for our, our argument. And so this lemma is inspired by a somewhat similar lemma due to Sheetoff for the case D equals two. So in one of these works of Sheetoff for upper bounding extension complexity for two dimensional polytopes, um, he had some important lemma for two dimensions. And so this is a kind of a somewhat, I mean, basically a higher dimensional version of that lemma. Okay, so here's what, what our lemma says. So suppose F prime is a small patch of facets of this polytope P. So P is this given polytope. And now suppose F prime is a small patch of its facets and V prime is a subset of its vertices so that the vertices in V prime are all far away from these facets in F prime. Okay, so, um, so this is obviously not very precise. I'll give you a picture in the next slide. But so now what we wanna do is, um, we want to consider the V prime cross F prime sub matrix of M. So that means the sub matrix of the slack matrix M where we only take the rows indexed by V prime and the columns indexed by F prime. So we only restrict to those vertices in V prime and those faces in F prime and take that sub matrix of the slack matrix M. Then the lemma says that the non-negative rank of the sub matrix is bounded. So it's of the form over form. Okay, so um, but let so before showing you a picture of what I mean by this lemma is um, let me mention that Cheetah's version of the lemma for D equals two does not require this far away assumption here. So here we are assuming that V prime, that these vertices are far away from uh, faces in F prime for the two dimensional case, Cheetah only needs the vertices to lie outside the patch, but there's, they don't need to be separated from it by being far away. Um, and also um, for D equals two, the proof is much easier. So our proof here for more than two dimensions is geometrically much more involved. So the lemma basically gets much harder for more than two dimensions and um, one needs this additional far away assumption because um, otherwise it doesn't work. Okay, so here, let me now try to illustrate this with a picture. So what do I mean with a small patch of faces? Well, I mean, obviously, um, this is not a precise notion. I don't want to make the exact lemma statement precise, but what you should think of is just you take some kind of small area on the sphere and then you take all the facets there, like in this picture, this yellow area. Okay, and then V prime should be a set of vertices which are far away from this yellow patch. So here in this picture, the vertices in V prime are these black dots down here. And so this um, purple thing is the sphere 
But um, what's important here is that there's a gap of the part of the sphere um, where we allow the V prime vertices to be in with this patch. So here we have this yellow patch and then we have a gap. Um, and here the purple part starts where we kind of allow the V prime vertices to be, right? Because they're supposed to be far away from the yellow patch. Okay, and so now the statement of the lemma is that the non-negative rank of the slack submatrix where we only consider the vertices in V prime, so only these black dot vertices and only the facets in F prime, so only these yellow facets up here is bounded. So it's on form over form. Okay, and so let me give you a brief idea of how the proof of that roughly works. So the proof follows the following rough plan. So uh, we want to construct a polytope, which you might call a polyhedral lampshade polytope because it looks like a lampshade down here. So that's you, you said we have we have a question. Um, how small is f in the lemma? Um, so. Yeah. So the truth is, f doesn't actually need to be small. The you just need an amount of separation that's kind of something like. Um, uh, on the order of, so so for example, you could have your patch to be inside, say, some spherical cap of radius epsilon, and then the separation needs to be at least, I don't know, 30 epsilon or something like that, something linear and epsilon. So it needs to be small enough that then V prime isn't empty, right? Because if your epsilon was now more than, say, something like, uh, well, some, more than a certain constant, then if you kind of want 30 epsilon separation, that won't work anymore because there's enough space on the sphere. But apart from that, you don't actually need it to be small. I just phrased it that way because when we apply it, it will be small. And I think it's the easiest to think about it that way. But there is no actual condition of smallness here. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, I guess that answers the question. Okay, great. Okay, yeah. So what we want to do is find a um, polyhedral lampshade looking like polytope, like this um, reddish polytope here, um, with the following properties. So we want, so we call this Q. So this reddish Q here should have only a bounded number of vertices, and it should contain all these black dots. So so the kind of convex hull of this lampshade here should contain all these black dots, all these vertices in V prime. And also we want this red, um, red polytope here to be entirely on the positive slack side of the face that's in F prime. So what I mean here in this picture is, in this picture, if you kind of take the hyperplane or to one of these faces that's in F prime, then because of the way the picture is drawn, basically the whole polytope lies under that hyperplane. So you basically have this hyperplane up here, and then this whole polytope lies under the hyperplane. And so what we want here is that we want um, this po lampshade polytope Q to also be entirely under the hyperplane. In particular, it shouldn't intersect the hyperplane. Okay, so in other words, so what we mean here with positive slack side is just if you draw your picture differently, you can't say under, but what I mean is, the side of the hyperplane where kind of this, um, this slack function is positive. So which is basically the correct side of the hyperplane where the polytope, the, the origin polytope P is on. Okay, so it's not at all uh, clear how one to construct such a red polytope and I uh, don't have time to go into these details. And this is basically what makes the proof hard to actually construct such a polytope Q. But suppose for now, that we have kind of managed to geometrically construct such a polytope Q, then, um, then what we have is that each of these black dots here, so each vertex V and V prime, will lie in the interior of this lampshade polytope Q. So in particular, will be a convex combination of the vertices of Q. And so that means if we calculate the slack vector of this black dot vertex V here, with respect to the face that's in F prime, we can write that slack vector as a convex combination of basically the slack vectors we would get for the vertices of Q. So kind of for each vertex of Q of this lampshade polytope, we can compute all the slacks to these faces in F prime. And um, so we get one vector for each of 
the O of one vertices of Q. And now the trick is that every vertex V in V prime here, the slack vector of that vertex will now be a convex combination of the only O of one vectors we get for these vertices in Q. So in other words, for the slack submatrix M uh, that we care about here, this um, matrix M of V prime and F prime, every row of that matrix will be a convex combination of only O of one different non-negative vectors. And so that already implies that the non-negative rank of this matrix is only O of one. Okay, so this was just a brief sketch, but so this is roughly how this lemma has proved. Okay, so now let me use the remaining few minutes to tell you what we do with this lemma. So again, we fixed D at least two and we wanted our P to be a D-dimensional random polytope, which was obtained as the convex hull of N independent random points on the unit sphere. So now, typically, as we said, the vertices of P are fairly well distributed over the sphere. So they don't clump together in any place. And also they don't leave any big holes. So that means particularly the facets of P are fairly small. So there's no gigantic face face it because it's just unlikely you would miss such a big part of the unit sphere with your random points. Okay, so now here's, here's roughly the plan of our approach. So it's obviously just a sketch. So, so what we do is we cover um, our sphere by on the order of square root n small spherical caps. And so now um, using these kind of properties that we get from the randomness of P, we can ensure that each facet of P is inside one of these caps, but also each cap only has O of square root N vertices of P. So because the vertices are not clumped together anywhere too much. So we will be able to at least um, symptotically almost surely, we'll be able to find these O of square root N small caps so that um, each facet of the polytope is inside a cap but each cap only has O of square root N vertices in it. And now we, um, our plan is to apply the lemma from the previous slide, uh, slide to the patches of facets inside the different caps. So for each of these caps, we get a patch of facets inside it, and then we wanna apply this lemma. Okay, so that will then partition the slack matrix of P into different parts. Um, so where the parts basically correspond to kind of, I mean, so the, the columns are partitioned by which cap the facet lies in, and the rows are partitioned by which cap the vertex lies in. And so by the lemma, we will see that most of these parts now have small non-negative rank. But um, the difficulty is to deal with the slacks of basically the diagonal blocks of this, um, of this partition. Um, so, um, if we take the slacks of vertices with respect to facets which are actually nearby, we can never apply this lemma because we had this far away assumption. And so the lemma is never able to deal with the slacks of vertices with respect to nearby facets, which roughly speaking correspond to the diagonal blocks of this matrix. I mean, there's a bit more technical stuff going on. I mean, in, in actually what we do is we also color the caps to then have caps of the same color being far distance out from each other and then considering the color separately. But so I'm, I'm sliding a lot of details under the rug here, but basically the main challenge is to, um, to handle kind of basically the diagonal parts of the, diagonal block parts of the matrix where we have slacks of vertices with respect to facets which are nearby and in the same cap. And so um, to handle this, we actually need a stronger version of the lemma. So I, I lied when I told to you that this was the key lemma. In fact, the actual key lemma is a much more complicated technical statement, basically relying on the same idea, but being much harder to write down. Um, so this kind of more technical version of the lemma um, allows to make also certain subtractions from the, sub, uh, from the slack matrix. So basically it's a statement of the form if you have a matrix that is obtained from the slack matrix by making certain types of subtractions, then that sort of submatrix still has not bounded non-negative rank. And so with allowing these subtractions, we can then deal with these diagonal parts by kind of subtracting them away in a certain way. And so, with, so that means then with a stronger and more technical version of the lemma, 
we can then actually use this approach to show that the select matrix of P has non negative rank at most O of square root N. And that means P has extension complexity at most O of square root N. And so that finishes what we wanted to prove. And that's all I wanted to say. So thank you for your attention. Great, thank you, Lisa, for a, for a, a lovely talk. Um, so uh, please, um, if people would signal in the in the chat if they'd like to, to ask some questions, um, may, maybe I I could start off with a couple. Um, so one question, I, and I, I think there's a question in the chat on a similar in a similar vein, is about the the distribution or the models that you use. I was going to ask if if you use a Gaussian rather than sort of just placing either on a sphere or in a ball. Would, would your techniques work there? Um, so certainly not the way, um, I mean, they certainly wouldn't work kind of literally. So it's possible that some of the ideas could still be used, but um, certainly our proof wouldn't work for that because we, I mean, we very much make use of the sphere geometry. So kind of with all these caps and so on. and with a Gaussian, if you kind of have points very far away, it kind of basically entirely skews the polytope in kind of one direction. And so you can't really make this, this um, approach with these sphere caps and this, this sort of polyhedral lamp shape and all of this will kind of basically all fall apart. I see, okay, thank you. And, and the other question I had is sort of slightly vague question, but, um, so if you think about the kind of configurations of points, say, in, in, in the sphere, um, where the extension complexity is low, um, are they in some sense kind of rigid, or is there a little bit of freedom to move the points around? Um, that's a great question. So all I can tell you is if you consider the say for some number k, you consider the configurations of points where the extension complexity at, is at most k, then that will be a closed set. So kind of in the kind of space of all polytopes, this will be a closed set. But that doesn't tell us whether that's kind of rigid and lower dimensional or not. I mean, that's basically ties in with the fact that the, the kind of um, heuristic or the intuition should be that having lower extension complexity is a special property described by some closed set, which likely is lower dimensional than the whole space of polytope, but who knows? Um, and kind of if you choose something generically, you should kind of or randomly, you should lie outside that set, so you should exhibit maximum possible extension complexity. But that's obviously just heuristic. So the only thing that I think is not so hard to see is that the um, so the only thing that I know is true, and I think it's not so hard to see, um, is that if you take extension complexity at most k, you'll get a closed set. But that doesn't tell you anything about the topology more than that. It's just closed. Okay, thank you. Uh, Christina, I think you had a question. So suppose you take your sphere model and you divide by square root of n and then let n go to infinity. Do you expect a random limit or do you expect something that's essentially deterministic? Um, we haven't studied that. I think that's a very natural question to ask, but so for us, I guess there's, um, I, I mean, so, so I guess our results just say it's theta of n and there's a gap between the lower bound uh, constant and the upper bound constant. I mean, the, the constant both depend on d, but for fixed d, I guess you have a lower bound constant and an upper bound constant. And we didn't study it all to try to nail this down more precisely, but I think that's very interesting. Um, I think one would need much stronger techniques and better ideas, though, because the lower bound techniques kind of it's so the, the, these um, this proof of Fiorini, Rothos, and Tivari, for example, it's a very nice proof, but it's kind of by totally unexpected methods. So it's um, it's using transcendence degrees of field extensions and so on. And then the upper bounds use all this partitioning. And I think in both of these um, proofs, you would naturally expect to lose constants. Certainly in our proof with all the partitioning, you'd expect to lose constants. And so one would need to work much harder to say something um, about the question you asked. But I think it's a very interesting question. 
Thank you. And thank you for a beautiful talk. Uh, do, do we have any more questions? Um, I have a question, but I think I stole half stole half this question. But please do go ahead and. Sorry, I just have a, one quick question. If you go, please can go you go back to uh, slide nineteen? So your sub matrix, right? So your sub matrix, essentially the, I mean, the entries in the matrix and the sub matrix are all large, right? Because you're, you're, oh, you're, the things are far apart. Yes. Is that what implies the non-negative rank? being order one, or do you have to use sort of extra conditions? Um, so. You have to use extra conditions. So just things being large in itself won't kind of imply that it's low non-negative rank. Because for low non-negative rank, um, I mean, it's similar to um, if you have a matrix and you know the entries are large, that won't tell you the rank is around, okay. right? Just perturbing things a little bit can already change the ordinary rank. Uh, a lot and the non-negative rank is at least the ordinary rank. So certainly them being large in itself won't be enough. But what you say is still a very, I mean, it's still a very good remark because when we do these subtractions, we put, I mean, the version as written here does not incorporate any sub the subtractions. But as I mentioned at the end, we actually need something more complicated than what's written here, where we allow subtractions of these matrices. And there we crucially use that these entries are large because after we subtract, we still want them to be non-negative. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense to talk about the non-negative rank of the matrix. Okay, thank you. Okay, so maybe this is a, a, a good point to, uh, to uh, stop the tea. Um, so we have another talk in, in half an hour, um, but, but before we stop, let me, uh, uh, let me thank uh, Lisa again for a wonderful talk. Um, 